and welcome into the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Glad that you're with us for episode 48, if you have been counting. Great show today. Bill Thomason, president and CEO of Keeneland, will join us talking about the situation in horse racing in general. We'll talk about this relatively new-founded coalition and what the future is for that. And then Michael Blowen, he is the president of Old Friends Farm, a retirement community for horses. It's really a story that's movie-like. And it's started by a movie critic. Maybe that's more appropriate. They'll be our guests today, Bill Thomason and Michael Blowen. Glad that you're with us. With us on lead guitar is Scott Hall. Hello. On bass, Ben Chaffins. Hey. And our researcher, Mr. Thomas Kenny. Hey, everybody. All right, let's talk about the big news of the week, which is the Pegasus. Remember when it started out the richest race in the world, held in mid-January down at Gulfstream Park in Florida. It debuted not that long ago, 2017, Thomas. And tell us the winners of the big race of the Pegasus for three years. 2017, it was Arrogate. 2018, Gunrunner. And 2019, City of Light. And the big deal of that was the horses would stay around on the track and not retire immediately after the Breeders' Cup, right? That's right. Incentive to stay. $1 million entry fee. This was the ultimate. My horse is faster than yours. It started as a $12 million purse. Richest horse race in the world. 2018. Increased to a $16 million purse. Still the richest. 2012 or 19, they broke it up. $9 million for a dirt race, $7 million for the grass race. This year, it's $3 million. This coming year, 2020, mm -hmm. it'll be a $3 million race. Uh, I'm not great at math, but that is quite a drop from $16 million. That's significant. And there'll be a $1 million turf race. As a friend of mine said, though, hey, you know, $3 million used to mean a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you'd say, boy, they followed on hard times. But the perception is they've fallen on hard times, I think. I guess it's that, you know, I don't want to put a lump in our Christmas stocking here in horse <laughs> racing. But I do think it's an interesting issue that the Pegasus has dropped that much. You know, I think another reason, there's not the great horse out there right now. Who you want to see? Maybe Bricks and Mortar again, who won it on the turf. Run again on the turf. Outside of that, we don't have the stars coming out of this year like we did in past years. Yeah, no justify, no pharaoh. Yeah, you know, so we don't have those. But what we do have is Bill Thomason of Keeneland coming up next when you come back here on the Horse Racing Show. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. Proud to announce that we've been downloaded in 22 countries and listened to around the globe on fine outlets like the one you're listening to. And a man that knows all about the globe and especially international racing, as well as what's happening right here in the States, is Bill Thomason, the president and CEO of Keeneland in Lexington, Kentucky, one of the true showcases of horse racing. And Bill joins us now. Welcome to the show. Any thanks, and thanks for having me on the show. Well, we caught up with each other. Uh, we passed by every now and then. We happened to be on the same flight coming back from the Breeders' Cup, and it was good to talk about a lot of things there. And I thought it'd be good to get your input on just the world of racing as we know it today, Bill. Well, as I'm sitting here in my office looking outside at a beautiful snowstorm that's starting <laughs> in Lexington, Kentucky, <laughs> it's, oh, it's great to be talking about sunshine and and beautiful racing. Yeah, you, you think, uh, and doesn't it always snow or get cold the first part of April at the start of the Keeneland meet? It's just like you, it, you don't need a meteorologist to tell you that. Well, that's the actu actually the opposite of what always happens. Beginning <laughs> of the April meet, the sun shines. It's the beginning of spring in Kentucky. And <laughs> exactly. The trees are blooming. and I, I do have a picture inside my desk that I keep that's got uh, that's got one of those snow filled opening days just to keep us uh, keep us on track here and humbled about about what Mother Nature can do to you. Well, one thing Keeneland should never be humbled about is the great showing for the Breeders' Cup in 2015. And I imagine there were some questions from people that probably didn't say it right to your face, but they thought, you know, it's, it's a small venue. Are they going to really be able to pull off this kind of event? And, of course, it was one of the great Breeders' Cups, highlighted, of course, by American Pharaoh winning the Grand Slam by taking the Classic that day. And you get ready now for 2020. How long have you been working already for the Breeders' Cup coming up in uh, 2020? 
Well, it might not surprise uh, you and everybody else that when we did it in 2015, uh, there were a lot of questions about uh, the facility, and and we we Breeders Cup had tried, and we'd been talking for years about about actually hosting a Breeders Cup, but we didn't do it until we could, were sure that we could do it well and we could do it right. So. Um, our team had confidence. Uh, there's not a person here that you will ever find that didn't believe it wasn't going to end up like it did. But obviously, it did have its it did have its challenges uh, for for a number of the things that we had to do to create the the kind of experience Kenny, that people expect when they come here. When people come to Keeneland, they have extremely high expectations about the day, about the quality of racing, and the way they're going to be treated, and just the overall experience. Our team works every single day to make sure that they exceed those expectations. Uh, so we were really proud of everything that we did, and uh, a lot of planning went into it. Community involvement, gosh, the community was so engaged and uh, and proud of it, and and just uh, just everything that all the events and and the parts surrounding it. And this is a community-owned uh, race course. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is our community and our industry feels a sense of ownership to Keeneland and pride, and, and we build on that. Um, so anyway, when it was, um, it, it was it was incredibly successful, as you said. I've heard nothing but rave reviews about our Breeders' Cup all around the world uh, these last four years uh, with great anticipation of coming back. So, it, so one of the things that might not surprise you is we were thoughtful as we went through the first Breeders' Cup about – okay, here's what we did. Here's what we accomplished. Here's what the event created for our industry. Now, when we do it next time, what are we going to change? What's next? You know, what are we going to do to improve? So we, we thought about that the minute that, the, that our first one was over. Uh, and consequently, we found very, very few things that we have to change. Uh, a couple of different of the venues that, that uh, we had some hiccups with, uh, in 2015, we're going to be adjusted a little bit, uh, but our transportation and the community engagement, we got some new things that the community's adding that uh, that Kip Cornette heads that they're going to be doing around town. Uh, so you're, people are going to see a lot of, of uh, now that first year we were kind of figuring out how we do it, now we get to talk about how we do it better, how we in uh, increase the uh, the enjoyment of the experience and for the people who are coming, uh, and and I promise you, it's going to be a whole lot more fun for me to try to figure <laughs> out how to do it better than it was just to make sure that we could do it the first time and do it well. Well, I mean, I I don't really know what you could do better. I, of course, you know, from my standpoint, it went well. I'm walking around covering Bob Baffert all day, so that was a happy day when he won the. <laughs> it's always nice to interview the winner. You know, the guys that finish second, it's not always easy to talk to, but. Uh, you know, with Keeneland is, is unique, and not just because this is home area for me and this is where our show's based and because I know you, uh, but like you say, the community involvement, there are few places that I know of that rally around the horse racing community like Lexington does and Keeneland does. Possibly Saratoga, New York is the only thing that immediately comes to mind. Uh, that's exactly right. When you go downtown and people have got the racing forms and programs and they're talking about horse racing and uh, they're talking about the breeding of the horses and where they come from and the, and the, and the people who are involved in the business. And, and so many people in the town are engaged in some way because it's, it's the farms. To think that within 30 miles of where this race is held, where the Breeders' Cup's held and where Keeneland's situated, more than half of the foals in the entire United States are going to be born and raised. Uh, and so the community feels great pride in that and great ownership, and they and they show it. Uh, and and for us, uh, all around the town, everybody is in some way connected then to the horse. There's just so yeah. many ancillary things that go on around Lexington uh, that that involve the horse. And Kenny, I have we've traveled all over the world, and and there's nowhere you go where where the horse is more at the center of the community and the culture and and the pride that people take in where they live. 
We're talking with Bill Thomason, the president and CEO of Keeneland. You mentioned about how close all the farms are, and of course, actually, that coincides with the sales. And Keeneland still has the most prestigious uh, sale around the country, around the world, actually, Bill, and it's been that way for many years. Kind of by accident, wasn't it? I believe like during gas rationing, uh, they couldn't take them up to Saratoga, so they put some tents up at Keeneland, and somebody figured out back in the 40s, you know, we got the farms here, the horses are basically here, why not bring them here? Well, they did. You're exactly right. That that kind of changed the dynamics uh, during the war when we always put our horses on boxcars and took them to, to Saratoga to sell, and, and we couldn't do that because you couldn't move any goods unless they were related to the war. So we always thought we had to take our horses where the money was to get them up into the east, and so we didn't know whether they were going to whether they were going to be able to travel and they were going to be able to show up in uh, in this little town of Lexington, which then was still the breeding capital of the world. I mean, it had been going on here for for centuries. Uh, so fortunately, they came, and fortunately, they continue to come. Not only from the United States, but really from 25 different countries that we sold to during 2019, and and that happens every single year. Do you ever feel? Did you feel pressure when you first took this job in 2012? I believe you're the only the seventh president and CEO at Keeneland. Uh, you know, you followed in some big footsteps and you haven't missed a beat. And I say that not out of friendship, but from observing how well everything is smooth. You, it was, it was seamless, the transition. Well, and that's not by accident. Uh, Keeneland is a, is a, is a unique institution, uh, with a tremendous amount of, of heritage, uh, and pride in the, in the organization from the time it was founded. And still, Kenny, the other businesses talk about that, but we look to that mission and we look to what Keeneland's all about. We're only about our industry, our community, and the care and the pride that we take in the facility. Uh, and that's instilled, and I am, <clears throat> I am only the, the seventh president here and a tremendous legacy of all the people who came before me. And every one of us, I think, if you sat us around in a room right now and said, listen, I, all, I'm, all I'm sitting here doing is I just don't want to be the guy that messes it all up. That's where I am. Uh, but it's the people are just fantastic, and and I I came from the breeding industry from outside for for 28 years with Alice Chandler, a, Alice Heedley Chandler, uh, oh, Mill Ridge Farm daughter. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, and and so the the things I learned about this place from the outside and the reverence that I had for Keeneland and the way it conducts itself in the community and the industry. Uh, when I got inside here, Kenny, I, I thought it was wonderful on the outside and on the inside. It's it's that much incrementally better. The people are passionate. They're dedicated. They care about this place, and they care about the mission and what it does. Um, so, yeah, I, the, the the first year was easy when I was too dumb to know what I what I was su supposed to be doing and what I was responsible for. Uh, yeah, I mean, then about six months after that scared me to death. <laughs> Well, well then, it doesn't show. You're like the duck on the water. I don't know how you're paddling underneath, but you look good on the surface. It's all the people surrounding me. Uh, they're, uh, without them, this would not happen like that. I've got trust and confidence and empower those people to do their job, and there's nobody in the world better than this Keeneland team. We're talking with Bill Thomason, the president and CEO of Keeneland. Of course, it has been a most interesting year in horse racing. We're going to talk about the coalition that uh, Keeneland helped put together when we come back here on the Horse Racing Show. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Thank you for tuning in. Bill Thomason is our guest, the president and CEO of Keeneland. He's had that position since 2012. And Keeneland at the forefront in many ways in the racing industry Probably none more so than uh, just a few weeks back when a coalition was formed. We know about all the problems and the deaths that's happened in horse racing this year and the safety concerns and the medication concerns. And, Bill, when everyone gets – well, most everyone got together at Keeneland in the industry. I think pretty much all the big players were there to sit around the table and discuss the future of racing. Well, they were, Kenny, and this is um, you're, you're talking about the racing jurisdictions around America uh, who uh, have who are committed, uh, understand the importance of this sport, and the people who count on us to be able to to conduct ourselves and and to 
not just to not just to help racing survive, but to have the conversations about helping racing grow again. It's a it's a such a tremendous sport. We got so many people around this country who care for these animals and love these horses and spend every single day they're parts of their family and uh, and 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 that's because of uh, certain things that have gone over th- that have happened during this past year highlighted a, a part of this business that none of us want. We we care so much for all these animals and nobody wants to see an accident happen on the racetrack and there's nobody more devastated than the people who who care for these horses every single day and who are responsible for them and feel that responsibility and we couldn't let that happen Kenny it was just not it was not acceptable to us uh we know that uh, it, it's, it's connected us together. We know that every single thing that happens at every one of our race tracks affects the other race tracks and affects this industry. And it's, it's one of those points in history when, when all of us kind of have a chance to look each other in the eye and say, Oh, we, we can't do this. We, it's too important. Too many people's lives are at stake and our horses, we care for them too much. And we've got to We've got to do things that don't just talk about it, but that show the concern and the care that we have for our sport and our animals and, and the athletes that are involved in this sport. And we got to do something about it. And it is a bunch of serious, like-minded people who are committed right now. And we started something that I think uh, people are going to see the results of, and they're going to see that we're not finished yet either. Bill, is one of the first things, and I don't know, you, you can tell me what the first thing is. I'm just curious about no medication. Race day seems to be the way to go right now. No Lasix, which, of course, I think most people know is a diuretic to help control uh, bleeding problems a horse might have. No uh, Lasix for two-year-olds coming up in, in 2020. Uh, I believe I'm getting some of this right. I don't know. What is the main thing right now that you think they have to be done, uh, well, with some urgency? Well, that, that was even earlier, Kenny. We we made that uh, that. Uh, decision some time ago. Uh, it was kind of the beginnings of when this group came together. Uh, so we came to get, uh, we created the compromise on Lasix uh, to get it out of race day, like you said, for uh, two year olds in 2020. And in 2021, uh, there will be no Lasix in any stakes races uh, at any of our racetracks. And those things uh, were the first things that we decided to do together. And that group grew to a number of other racetracks uh, around the country. I'm proud to say that uh, last week our racing commission in Kentucky approved that regulation to, to go into place, which is now flowing through the regulatory process. And we're glad to have been able to, to do that. And to and once again, those places that we did what we said we were going to do. But now the commission's moved on. Those are arguably in what, what people would talk about is that is not necessarily – uh, what you would consider a safety issue for the horses. That when we talk about horses breaking down on the racetrack, there's arguments about where where Lasix fits in the spec- spectrum of the things that are that are causing the problems we've had uh, during this past year. So now we're talking about safety and integrity issues, and we're talking about medication reforms in these coming uh, in these coming uh, this coming racing season that are and and different. Ab- initiatives that are going to make a difference in the safety of our horses on the race course and that are going to help uh, our jockeys and are going to help this the, the entire industry show the care and concerns that we've got. So those are the medication reforms. Those are um, on the anti-inflammatory drugs, restricting them. It's on the treatment of horses at various times to be able to allow our athletes to be able to, to show when they're sore and show when they're not right and they're not ready to get on the racetrack. Uh, that's our that's our commitment and that's our responsibility to make sure that we're putting horses on that racetrack that are healthy and sound uh, and ready to compete. So those are the things that we started and that we announced when we first got together a few weeks ago. The racetracks uh, ta- uh, announced the coalition actually in the formal formation of the of the coalition. Uh, but 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 it's a beginning. You know that's the thing we're trying to get across to everybody. This is this is just the start. There's there's seven or eight things or whatever we talked about that we think that we're going to be the most impactful, um, but we know that we've got a whole lot of work to do and we're we're talking every single day about what's next. Tom with Bill Thomason, president and CEO of Keeneland. We're talking about this coalition that was recently formed. 
uh, a kind of a rare moment, and I guess a moment, a mother of necessity kind of moment, Bill, where all the tracks, and we know horse racing, you know, everybody's kind of got their own little area they're going to take care of. But uh, there was importance in coming together. Was any any hesitation out there? You don't have to name names if you don't want to, but you know, I'm just curious if there was any state that said we'll still take care of this on our own. Well, everybody that that's been that that's been centuries of of this horse business. Yeah. You know, all of and when you look around the country, you know, we've got huge markets here: California, New York, Florida, Kentucky. We're all have great pride in the way that we go about it. And, and in a commercial marketplace, thank goodness, everybody doesn't think the same way. Right. Everybody, you know, thinks that their way of doing it's right. And people who breed horses, that's the way it's right. And people who race horses, there, everybody's got their things that they think are important. And they think they do it pretty well. And we've got jurisdictions who, in those different jurisdictions, they've got different political uh, views about horses. The economy of the industry is different in different states and different in, in different places. So... And these rules and regulations and things have evolved. So obviously, over time, we've all been skeptical of each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're, the other thing you said is right. That, that you, we all have that, whether it's an epiphany or you have that moment where, like I said, we just kind of look each other in the eye and say, everybody, this is, we're in this together. You know, we, so instead of us taking pride and bragging about how we do it or or thinking that we're the ones who know everything, we can't do that anymore. We've got to share best practices. We gotta we gotta share things. These horses move from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and and all of us are gonna be able to help each other and as we all get better, our industry is gonna get better and the health of our industry is gonna get better. Therefore, each one of us is gonna benefit. So let's we, we can't do that. So we had to kind of put the egos in, in, under, in the box for a minute, and we had to, to agree to work together, and we know that each one of us has got to go about achieving things in different ways uh, within our jurisdictions and at our race courses, but we're going to support and help each other so that all of us are able to, to, to do things that are going to provide more uniformity around the country, and uh, it, it's never been like this. That, that, I, that I can, from, from the time I've been involved in the 38 years that I've been involved in the business. I've never seen a coming together of like minds like we're seeing right now. A rare moment and, and a good moment and a needed moment for certain, Bill. And, you know, I believe you were on your way to Tokyo just after the Breeders' Cup, uh, getting ready to go. And, and, of course, you mentioned the countries all involved in the Keeneland sales. What's kind of the world perception of the United States racing scene right now? Uh, around the world, Kenny, it was one of those things that if we all listened to what was happening around the world, uh, we would have been embarrassed. Um, they have had different, this, this lack of, of race day medication and the perception of permissiveness in the United States. Th- those are the things that I heard. And especially if you look back to five years ago that were, that were distressing, you know, to, and should have been to all of us, they weren't all true. They were perceptions, and they were being uh, talked about in different marketplaces. Uh, once again, they were perceptions. So there were a lot of those things that were not rooted in truth. They they weren't talking about the quality of our of our testing standards, and they weren't talking about the quality of care and the things that are happening to our business. But it was a but it was a perception. Uh, what what I heard three five years ago, uh, it's a totally different conversation now. Uh, around the world than what I heard then. They see that we're taking action. They see that we're serious about it. They see that we're that we're not only talking about, but we're making reforms that are bringing us more in compliance with some of the rules that have that are in place around the world, and not only putting them in compliance with what's around the world, but our some of the things that we're doing go beyond what other jurisdictions are doing. But we're not kind of bragging about we're doing it one way and they're doing it another. We're we're trying to say, listen, y'all, we're all trying to do things better for the horse. So around the world, share best practices. If if we're doing it better than you're doing it, don't be afraid of that. If you're doing something that we need to bring into our jurisdictions that are going to help the hate, health and safety of our horses, we're going to embrace those things. So I, I think around the world, I've I heard a different conversation when I went to Tokyo with all the people who who had gathered there together from all over the world for the races than than I've heard and than I've ever heard actually. Bill, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for your insight and for being on. We got to do this more often. 
Any, you call me anytime. There's, uh, I, I love seeing you. We, we ought to talk more than just when we sit together on an airplane. Definitely so. And have a Merry <laughs> Christmas and, and hopefully get some rest over the holidays, you and everybody at Keeneland. Thanks, Kenny. You too. Have a great holiday. All right. Thank you. Bill Thomason, president and CEO of Keeneland, certainly one of the world leaders in the sport. We'll be back with more here on the Horse Racing Show. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Thank you for being with us. Now, let me pitch this movie at you. Well-regarded Boston Globe movie critic moves to Georgetown, Kentucky over a decade ago. He starts a retirement community for old racehorses called Old Friends Farm in Georgetown, Kentucky. Are you buying in that scenario? Are you ready to sign up Matt Damon or George Clooney to be the star of it or Brad Pitt? Well, it's a true story, and the man that got it all started growing from one paddock and a couple of horses to over 100 acres and over 100 horses is Michael Blowen, the president of Old Friends Farm, and our guest now. Michael, welcome in. Oh, Kenny, thanks so much. It's great talking to you. You know, as you described that movie, probably if I was reviewing it, I'd say it's too corny to believe. <laughs> I was going to say, are you buying this? Because I wouldn't have bought it if you'd told me that in 2002, the year before you got it going. <laughs> I know. It's amazing. I, I, I'm surprised every day, you know, that I get to wake up and look out my back window and there's Silver Charm and his old rival, Touch Gold. And so over there's War Emblem and Game On Dude and Little Mike and Sun King and Albert the Great and the whole list of the the stars. You know, I didn't get that excited over meeting too many movie stars, but I really got excited about having these horses. I just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm enthralled. So you wake up one day in Boston, I don't know, it's snowing or whatever the situation. You say, I think I'll go to Kentucky and start a retirement community for old horses. Well, that's almost it. I mean, I only got into it at first because I liked the drinking and the gambling part. <laughs> uh, I didn't, I, the only thing I knew about horses when I first got involved in handicapping was that I was afraid of them. And, uh, but I apprenticed myself out to a old bottom of the barrel trainer up at Suffolk Downs named Carlos Figueroa. Yeah. And, uh, I worked for him for a year and a half and they never got paid, but I did stalls and took care of the horses. And, and I just, I just really liked it. It was really good exercise. I was too old to play basketball at that point. So I had to find something else to do. And I, I get up every morning at five thirty and drive out to the track, get there about six fifteen, start doing my work and after a while I, I started to fall in love with the horses and and that was it's always dangerous when you fall in love with anything but when you fall in love with these horses it's a, it's 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 a disease and uh at the end of the day when these horses you know were, that couldn't make money anymore were being trotted off I was told at the time to a uh, a riding academy in Maine I said gee whiz after a while I thought gee whiz you know I've been to a lot of times i've been to maine i've never seen one riding academy and then i realized that that's not what was happening yeah. and i thought it was really unfair when so in the back of my mind was always the idea that we should do better with these horses not just when they're racing and when they're breeding but also when the day is done because because they give a lot to us and and they've earned every penny of it it's not that we're giving them anything they've earned every bit of it so that's how it started and then as time went on, uh, my wife, Diane White, was a award-winning columnist at the Globe. And um, I told her after we retired, I wanted to try this. And I said, you're going to come, right? And we lived in Harvard Square. And it's a big difference between Harvard Square and where we moved to, which was Midway, Kentucky. <laughs> and uh, she waited about 20 minutes. And she goes, okay, I'll go with you, but only under one condition. I said, okay, what's that? And she goes, that when I leave you, you won't come looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God she's still here. So. <laughs> good, good. We want to keep this a happy story, you know, around yeah, the holidays. Exactly. <laughs> hey, Michael, when uh, we're talking with Michael Blowen, who's the president of Old Friends Farm. Now, when you come to Kentucky, did you think right away this concept of yours to have this retirement community for old thoroughbreds would just be embraced and people would be showering you with money and it would just take off like a rocket? Yes, I did think exactly that. I thought... Well, 
I thought, you know, heck, they were going over to the, the horse park. And, you know, I first came to Kentucky. I was sent to Memphis to interview Jerry Lee Lewis for the weekend. And I was coming back, and I said, I'm going to go to Kentucky because Bull Forbes was at the horse park, and I wanted to see Bull Forbes. So I cut into Kentucky. It was the first time I ever was there. And I saw that the horse park had done this marvelous thing with retiring these famous old horses, and that was always in the back of my mind. And then I thought, well, you know, if, if we do it on a larger level, uh, we could we could also attract visitors. And, and, and with some of these famous horses that that uh, weren't breeding and, and racing anymore, and we'd attract a lot of visitors, and that happened. But I really naively thought it would be embraced uh, immediately, and it, it wasn't. And it's only in later years that I figured out why they didn't like it at first, you know. Was there a time when you thought, you know what, I, tra- I did my best, I've tried hard, we've got – three or four, maybe a dozen horses out here now, but this is it. I, I just can't keep doing this. No, it's absolutely, I had, no, I probably should have. A smart person would have said, okay, the white flag is up. This is enough. Uh, forget about it. But, you know, every every time I even thought about the fact that it might not work, even briefly, something always positive happened uh, to, to, to change everything. Either it was a new horse coming in, or we got a significant donation. I remember uh, Jerry Moss, of course, who campaigns in Yada and other horses. He gave us our first big horse, and that was a beautiful black horse named Ruhlman. Mm-hmm. And Ruhlman uh, and Ruhlman came here, and 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 he he came at a time we really needed another famous horse. And so, you know, every time that it seemed like we were headed for disaster. Uh, some very generous person would donate money, or somebody would donate a a horse, and it would it it, it would give us all uh, we'd all get re-energized. And I think that's what's happened all all the way along. It's like it's like uh, Ramon Dominguez, whose uh, uh, favorite horse is Fabulous Strike. Yeah. Um, he he told me that when he hit the top of the lane usually these speed horses would start to back up a little bit and somehow he found a a gear and that's why he was he's ramon's favorite horse and that's the way i felt we hit the top of the stretch we're running out of gas all of a sudden you know we hit another gear and 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 take off and now and now things thank goodness are going a lot better and people come to the farm if they want to get in touch with michael blowen and the old friends farm in georgetown kentucky is it pretty easy to do the website and things to set up a tour Oh, very easy. Now, we're on our winter tours now, which means we give one tour a day at 11 o'clock. But during the season, when springtime comes, we do uh, tours three times a day at 10, 1, and 3. And that's for $15. And I tell people if they don't like it, I'll give them double their money on their way out. And so far, nobody's had the nerve to ask me for their money back. <laughs> um, and you get to feed carrots to these amazing horses and hear all their stories. I mean, we just got uh, Soy Fett from California uh-huh. uh, and Hoagie and all these old geldings that are 10, 11 years old that have put in their time, and now now they're here, and it's really amazing. Yeah, I think horse. I think any animal that feels like it's getting a second chance, because both of my golden retrievers were rescue dogs, uh, I, I think that there's something about that. I, maybe you get that sense with a horse. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting too romantic over the holidays here, Michael. But but maybe they get the chance. Hey, you know, I'm here. And maybe I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Michael Blowen and the old friends guys. Well, I don't know if they think that, Kenny, but I'll tell you something. You're not you're not f- far off. The thing is, is what what's impressed me so much about these animals is, you know, Silver Charm's breeding's not that good, his confirmation's bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the horses, uh, certainly uh, uh, our emblem never threw anything close to what she, what he did with war emblem. But, you know, these horses that are the really good ones are smarter than everybody else. And quite literally, uh, they have to be trained, of course, when they're racing, and they have to be trained when they're breeding. But when they come here, the, it's exactly the opposite. They train us. You know, we pretty much know what, what each individual horse wants and, and when they want it. And as long as we comply... Uh, they're they're very very easy to be around and and uh, a lot of fun, but but they they're definitely running the place and I mean that quite literally. We're talking with Michael Blowen, president of Old Friends Farm. More with him when we come back here on the Horse Racing Show.
Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. We hope you've had a good Christmas, a happy Hanukkah. It's a happy time for you going into the new year. And possibly you're feeling a little more benevolent than usual. You might want to think about the Old Friends Farm in Georgetown, Kentucky. It's a wonderful facility. Where do old racehorses go? Many of them, and some of the great ones, have gone there to Old Friends, which started in 2003 because of Michael Blowen, who came from Boston, where he was an established movie critic at the Globe and got it all going, and we're talking with Michael now. Uh, has anybody approached you, by the way, about making a movie of this? Because, I mean, this is Disney-like. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, try, I I thought it would make a good animated movie, kind of, you know, in, in, and, and have the horses talk and, <laughs> and things like that. But, but no, not, we, they haven't been breaking down uh, doors to do that, but it certainly would be, it certainly would be fun. You know why? I'm going to tell you, this computer-generated stuff is ruined movies. I, yeah. I like I like all the you know it's fine I give the Iron Man and all that I've seen a few of them but my goodness you, you know nobody really acts that much anymore it's all about uh, I'm gonna do it in front of a green screen. About three weeks ago, Kenny Martin Scorsese wrote a wonderful op-ed column at the uh, for the New York Times that you might want to look up on the internet because he makes precisely the same point. Uh, you know, yeah. Scor Scorsese and I think a lot alike. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Hey, did you have, while we're talking about the movie, we're going to get back to the horses right now. Do you have like a favorite, I don't know if you can ever say as many movies as you've critiqued over the years and just simply watch for enjoyment. Is there a movie or two that really grabs you to this the day? The one I really like the most for a variety of reasons is Chinatown. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like Chinatown and I like uh, Casablanca an awful lot because I was very good friends with uh, Julius J. Epstein, mm, yeah. who, who uh, wrote with his twin brother. With the twin Cosmo brothers, Blanca. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know that his grandson is Theo Epstein, who runs the Cubs. I didn't, you know why I knew who Theo Epstein was, but no, I did not. And how do you get yeah. away from the Red Sox, by the way? I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not. In fact, John <laughs> Farrell, the former manager of the Red Sox, came on a tour here a few months ago. We had a great time. Oh, man, that's great. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, Chinatown. I understand you've got a pretty good relationship with the legendary Jack Nicholson. Yes, we do. Jack's a, a really wonderful supporter of ours. Um, he's been supported since the uh, since You mean the like beginning. financial supporting of the farm? Yeah, yeah. How about and, that? Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he, he used to, I used to go to the basketball games with him, and it was like an out-of-body experience. I go, what am I doing here, standing here, sitting down here in the front row of the forum with, with Jack <laughs> watching this basketball game? But he's a really wonderful guy. He's very down-to-earth. Still lives in the same house he bought after Easy Rider. Uh, in fact, it used to be if you went through the main gate up on Mulholland Drive to his house, if you went straight, you got to his house. If you went to the left, you got to Marilyn Brando's house. If you went to the right, you got Charlton Heston's house. And uh, as they, as uh, Marlon passed away and, and Charlton Heston passed away, Jack uh, uh, bought both of those houses. So now he owns the whole thing. But it's quite a little community back there. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's, and that's Hollywood that, you know, we won't see again, will we? We won't no, see we won't. that kind of Hollywood back in those. I, I had the pleasure of interviewing Donna Michi one time at Santa Anita. We're standing on the apron, very few people around. It was, it was for a, a special that we were doing leading up to the Breeders' Cup. And he's pointing up in the stands. He said, yeah, Todd Power and I used to sit there, and Betty Grable would come by sometime. And I'm thinking, you know, that's, that's the thing that racing – you know, we may not get again. You know, Sea Biscuit was made, but they didn't. All the stars didn't flock to the racetrack afterwards. No, I think I think you're absolutely right, and I love those. I love those stories. I mean, one of the reasons I like Chinatown so much is John Houston was like my godfather out there. Whenever anybody didn't want to do an interview or something, John would would call him and say, "Well, this guy at least write down what you say," and he'd say some nice things, and I didn't end up getting the uh, getting the interview. And in fact, that's how I, I that's how I met Jack. Uh, originally he was doing an interview with the new york times and the la times and all of us in the hinterlands of chicago sun times and the tribune and uh, washington post we all had to put our names in a hat and jack was going to pick one out to do an interview with and john said he should talk to me and that's how i got to be friends with nicholson because of john and i met john because i had a racing for him sticking out of my pocket when i interviewed him and he wanted to go to the racetrack <laughs> so, <laughs> I owe it all to the racing form. <laughs> it's amazing how it comes together like that, isn't it? It's, it's really not uh, six degrees of separation sometimes in horse racing. Yes, it is. It's a marvelous, <laughs> it's a marvelous sport. We've just got to make it better. 
Old Friends Farm, what is needed out there now, Michael? What keeps it going? And we talked about the winter tours. They can go online or they can make a call. It's easy to find out where you guys are in Georgetown, Kentucky. But uh, what would you really like to have for, for Christmas there at the Old Farms, uh, Old Friends Farm? Well, we're, we've got we've got a little additional pr- property, and I'm, I'm raising the money now to put up some more fence and put up some waterers and uh, – and so we're we're just looking. I, I'm always looking just to get a little bit more land and a little bit more uh, property so that we can provide uh, homes for these horses. Because obviously, when they come here, they're totally retired. They're, this is the end of their careers. Period. And uh, and so we don't we don't get the kind of turnover that that some of the really good organizations do that that retrain their horses. So the only way that we can expand is by getting more land and, and putting up more fence and putting up more run-in sheds and providing a, a, a quality uh, of life for these great athletes. How big is the staff out there? Are most of them paid or how many are volunteers? All the people that work with the horses are paid um, for a number of reasons. We want to get really professional people and um, and have them do it so, so that the horses, again, get the best care they can possibly get. And then, so we have eight paid employees that work on the farm. And then in the office, we have three paid employees. But the wonderful thing and the best thing about it are our tour volunteers. The people who give the tours are all volunteers, and they do a magnificent job. And they, they tell these horses stories in, uh, in, in magnificent ways. And people hopefully leave the, leave the farm being very impressed by the storytelling ability of our volunteer tour guides because they're unbelievable. And it's, it's it's wonderful. Everybody loves it that's been there. They, they, I wonder how many people know your background that come there, know about all the movie stars you've met and all the movies you've seen. There's a few of them that do. Every once in a while, some really old person from Boston will show up. <laughs> 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 Say, I remember you. Or, uh, they mostly remember my wife because she was a great columnist, and they mostly remember her. She was fabulous. Is uh, is what would be your favorite horse racing movie? You know, that's a really good question. I I, I used to say Casey Shadow, Walter uh, Matthau. Yeah, and yes. Walter was a great horse player too. Yeah. Um. And I do like that movie an awful lot, but I don't know. I think Stanley Kubrick's The Killing with St- Sterling Hayden is a magnificent movie. And uh and also this 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 one with uh with William Holden that's very rarely seen uh, called Boots Malone. Yeah, wow, that's going back. I mean, I don't even know how many times Turner Classic has that on anymore. Yeah, it, it it's hard to get. Uh but it's really I think it's really well done and it really does give you a sense of the background especially at the bottom row. And the other one I really like and it's not hard uh, really a horse racing movie but but it's called Lean on Pete. Yeah. And it's a great great movie that nobody saw because it had very limited uh distribution. Uh but it's about a kid and and racing at the bottom of the barrel and uh and it's a really really good story in the and uh, it really gives you a, I think they shot it, actually, at Portland Meadows. Yeah, I think so. I remember reading about that. Well, if you yeah, want to know about it, movies and you want to know how to take care of old, deserving thoroughbreds, Michael Blowen is the man at Old Friends Farm in Georgetown, Kentucky. Michael, happy holidays. Thanks for being with us and continued success out there. Kenny, thank you so much. You know, come visit us. I need some tips for Keeneland. Okay, we'll be there. <laughs> Stay with us. More on the horse racing show after this. Welcome back into the horse racing show. We really want to thank you for your support throughout this year. We're coming up on one year of this as we go into the Christmas season, and you've been a great present to us to keep us afloat out there on YouTube and on Google Play, iTunes. The Ville in Louisville, WVLK in Lexington, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, the outlets you can hear this show on. And you, you, go over to, you can go over to Thomas and Ben and Scott's house and listen if you want. That's true. Or <laughs> take a ride with us in the car. Yeah. Right in the car. That's hey, right. Yeah. That's my new favorite. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Uh, it was great to hear from Bill Thomason today. He made some interesting points, especially about being in, about the industry as a whole being embarrassed on a national, not a national, but a global scene, right. an international scene. And, of course, another point was that everybody thinks they're the best. Mm-hmm. Like, we've got the best horse racing show, but that's that's a given. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, 
yeah, I'd bring those other guys over here. No. <laughs> but, no, you all think everybody has that feeling, and that has been if there's a, a good situation and we'll keep it positive at Christmas time that comes out of everything bad that's happened this year and highlighted, of course, the horse deaths. I mean, that's going to be the story of 2019. It is that the industry never before has come together like it is now. You know why? Because it's a business. We can say we love the horses, we like the horses, we don't want the horses to die. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants it. People don't even like horse racing. They don't want that. But if it continues and the negative publicity continues, then the business side of it, people aren't going to the track as much. They're going to be making bets, and that's the real key. Money does the talking. Yeah, even, like you said, on a business side of things, even if there isn't bad publicity around it, if you lose a horse, you're losing money because that horse can't win. That's right. And, you know, I mean, the people that lose horses, even with insurance, they've lost money. It's, it's been tough. So now we will close on a positive note. Next week, Hall of Fame jockey Jerry Bailey joins us. We hope you will as well. We hope you have a blessed and happy Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Merry, merry to all. Scott Hall, yes, Ben sir. Chaffins, yes, Thomas Kenny. Merry Christmas, guys. You too, Merry Kenny. Christmas to you. Thanks for a great year. Thank you for tuning in. We look forward to talking with you again next week on the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. So long, everyone. <laughs>